everything to Jesus. We leave it at the cross and we are going to rejoice in God today because he has blessed us with the breath of life and we're excited to be called his children. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. We give you praise, oh Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. We sing the God I serve. The God I serve is mighty. The God I serve is holy. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. The God I serve is able. The God I serve is powerful. Yes, he is. We sing the God I serve. The God I serve is mighty, the God I serve is holy. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. The God I serve is able, the God I serve is powerful. Yes, He is. We sing that again. The God I serve is mighty, the God I serve is holy. Yes, He is. Yes, He is. The God I serve is able, the God I serve is powerful.
It doesn't matter what comes my way, the greater one who lives inside of me. His name is Jesus. I'm born a winner, more than victorious. I'm an heir of his kingdom, filled with the Holy Ghost.
to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. Oh, we love you. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. I worship
share that love with your neighbors all around you wherever you are all over this earth hallelujah we bless your mighty God Whether you're here physically or you are visiting, you're with us via KBN Live, YouTube, our Rivers SKB, we welcome each and every one of you. Hallelujah. We want to welcome those of you 
that are here with us for the very first time. If you're here with us for the very first time as our guest, we want to acknowledge you. Kindly stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Welcome. God bless you. Both of you. All three of you. Hallelujah. We pray that even as you're here, that the Spirit of God and the love of God will continue to be shed abroad in your hearts. God bless you. Two thousand and nineteen. Two thousand and nineteen. One last time. Two thousand and nineteen. It's all about Him. Amen. The following are the directives, divine directives, and announcements for the rest of the week and maybe the month. This evening, six thirty p.m. We're here again for evening service. Tomorrow, Monday, family, fun, and fellowship. On Tuesday at 6.30 to 7.30 p.m., it's Bible study for new believers. Wednesday at 11, healing and deliverance, 11 to 1. Yorkshire Christian University class is on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Wednesday to Friday at 7.30 p.m. is our friendship groups. And Saturday at 5.30 a.m. is our power encounter. Please join us as we celebrate the lives of these persons celebrating another year on earth. Lionel Pete, Keddy Snowland, and Jolivar Rosame. They're celebrating their birthdays tomorrow. Come on, give it up for them. Put your hands together for them. And on Friday, Tonya Kelly. Come on, put your hands together for them. Let's celebrate with them. Amen. We want to at least let you put it in your calendar. On the 27th to the 29th of March, there will be our corporate prayer and fasting. The 29th will be our corporate prayer meeting. And don't forget, get ready to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on the 21st of April. We encourage you to keep releasing a daily prayer covering over our set man, the visionaries of this house, over our church, over our nation, and of course our connecting churches in Nevis, England, Canada, St. Thomas, and St. Martin. There are always opportunities to serve here in Rivers, Celebration Team, Ushering Ministry, Children Ministry, Soundboot Ministry, Security Ministry, Parking Lot Ministry, Building Cleaning Ministry, Dance Ministry, Greeters Ministry, Transportation Ministry. Just let us know that you want to serve in these areas. Amen? Food Distribution Ministry comes up. It came up this weekend, but please, we encourage you to... Gave at least $20 monthly in feeding our nation, $20 in cash or in groceries, you are blessed. The book of the month for March is Kingdom Dynamics for the Apostolic Community at $45. Kingdom Dynamics, that's our set man's first book, Kingdom Dynamics for the Apostolic Community. Our bus schedule is in your bulletin, as well as the new arrivals of products for Dunamis Christian Supplies. Some of you have been asking for these, so we have gotten them now. Product Route Demons, $45. Profit Arise, $45. Two brand new Bibles, the New King James Study Bible, that's $140. And the new and the NIV Study Bible, $50. God's Creative Power Confession Book um, is $65. Max Alcado's God is with you every day. A daily devotional, that's $55. And we have brought in some healing oils. Amen. Pure olive oil, $25. And of course, the much anticipated and soon to go, prayer rain. Prayer rain is $125. It used to be $175, but you get, we got a great, we great um, price. To the back of your bulletin, we have a monthly um, praise for March. Amen. Oh, heavens, make a way for me. We have a few invitations we want to uh, mention here. The first one is Touched by His Wounded Hands Ministries International. And they are celebrating the eighth church anniversary on Wednesday, the 6th March, 2019. And they will be having some special meetings from the 4th to the 8th of March at 7.30 nightly. Also on the 10th at 7 p.m. That's at the new auditorium right there at Shadwell Extension. Also, worship, halal, praise, tabernacle. Um, we have an invitation from them for special meetings on the, from tomorrow, Monday, the 4th of March, to Friday, 8th of March, 
at the Solid Waste Management Corporation Conference Room, 7.15 p.m. nightly. The speaker is Apostle Randall Forlo. And finally, we have a special invitation from Resurrection and Life Church. They're celebrating their seventh church anniversary. And so they have commenced their celebrations yesterday, Saturday. And these celebrations conclude on the 8th of March. Some of these celebrations include today will be the anniversary service at 4.30. Monday, tomorrow Monday, right down to Friday, will be a special week of services at the auditorium Lower Fines Avenue. The speaker for these meetings is Pastor Velma Kirby out of Antigua, Evangelist Francois Squaw out of Barbuda. Amen. So let's go on out. Once you hear these invitations from this pulpit, you are free to attend. Amen. You are blessed. Come on, it's 2019. Okay, just this section here. For this section, it's all about him. I don't know for this section over here. All right, but it's all about him. It's opportunity for prosperity. Amen. Get excited. If you need an envelope, please lift your hand. The ushers will be willing and ready to give you one. We always encourage you to always bring a seed, bring an offering. As you come into the house of the Lord, always come with something to present to him. Amen. We are reading from the book of Psalm. Psalm 41, reading from verse 1. Just for focus this morning, it says, To the chief musician is Psalm of David. He said, Blessed is he that considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. Verse 2 says, The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. He shall bless him upon the earth. And thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. That will make all his bed in his sickness. It is a psalm this morning that encourages us to give or to consider the poor. A few weeks ago when uh, Tiffany's dad... Dr. Tiffany Dad, I don't remember his name. <laughs> What's that? Dr. Okonko. Am I going to get it right? Okay, okay. I get a nod behind there. Good. Uh, he said something very interesting and very important. I, I think it, 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 it is important for us maybe to, re to echo it this morning. And he shared it in the form of a testimony. He says, in Africa, when you get married, there ain't no waiting period about getting, your, getting to know your spouse. It's right away. You get, you get, you get married, you get pregnant. All right? And so he said, you know, going into the fourth year, they were trying and they were, there wasn't any babies or any baby. But he did something that, that caused th that to shift. He said, he took upon himself to start to take care of the less fortunate children in his area. When he did that, he said for the very first time, his wife missed her monthly. And then he knew that something has shifted, that something was changed. We, we at times, even as Pastor Penny said this morning, we do have here a food dispute food distribution ministry where we encourage you to give to that area of ministry so that we can distribute to those who are less fortunate among us. Yes. At times there are persons who are not working for a period of time and there are different reasons why they may need our support and our help. The scripture promises for the person who will consider the poor that there are about six to seven different types of blessing that will come upon that person. In verse 1 it says, he that considereth the poor, the Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. 
Verse 2 says, the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. And he shall be blessed upon the earth. He said he will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. Verse 3 says, And the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. And the word languishing has to do with anguish. There are periods of time, uh, a season in our lives, when you're going through a time of anguish. It may not necessarily be that you're lying down on a bed in pain, but you're, you are in a season of pain. You're a season of, 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 of anguish. He says, God will visit you in those moments. And he will make all his bed in his sickness. In other words, God will provide healing for the sick. Amen? And so this morning, I want to challenge us to give to this area of ministry, apart from all of your giving, to consider this area of ministry, the food distribution ministry, that gives or look after those who are less fortunate among us. Amen? Amen? All through scripture, we see this. We see this in the book of Ruth, for example. When Ruth and Naomi came from Moab, there was a practice in Israel when they harvest the lands that they must leave something for the poor. And so those who are less fortunate will go into the lands and they will gather the remain or the things that will leave on purpose for them. When you harvest your land in Israel in those days, you couldn't, you couldn't take everything. You must leave something for the poor. And that's what I want to encourage us this morning. Give something to those who are less fortunate. Not just this month, but do it. Let's, let's seek to do it on a monthly basis. Amen? Um, let's all stand as we get ready to give. If you need to give to that ministry this morning, on your envelope there is, uh, the, there is a label, Other. You could write food distribution and put how much you want to give to that ministry. Or you could write food hamper. And give him what you want to give to that ministry. Amen? Amen. Glory be to God. Let's begin to declare, I'm out of debt. My needs are met. I have plenty more to bless many more. And money keeps coming to me. They will see me. They are seeing me in my prosperity. And they are knowing and acknowledging that I'm blessed of God. 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 I am healthy. I am wealthy. And I'm wise. Come on, let's give unto the Lord.
We're going to remain standing. All of us, those who are sitting, we're going to ask you to stand. And let's welcome the woman of God for today, Pastor Tina. of the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. Thank you. God is good. I know we don't usually talk like that, but we can sometimes. Amen. Hallelujah. We want to just mention that um, mom and dad are on their way. They're still traveling. They will reach St. Kitts about 11.30 this morning. So um, as Minister Tony said, God's aviation agency has it covered. God is large and in charge. I love that. Who knows what um, it may seem like um, an event that is inconvenient. Their flight last night, they were supposed to arrive last night but uh, be due to technical problems with the plane, their flight was canceled. So God is good all the time. Amen. You don't know what tragedy could have been averted. Amen. So we just roll with the punches. <laughs> we just know that God has it all under control. Wasn't last Sunday's message so powerful? What's it last Sunday's message so powerful? Hallelujah. If you weren't here last Sunday morning, you missed something awesome. You missed a powerful message. And the word was powerful as well. Okay, it seems like we have a baby dedication this morning. I welcome the family of Jazania, Kylie, Devana. Are they here this morning? Hallelujah. Just welcome this family and the sponsors as they come. Hallelujah. We are just going to anoint the right big toe, the right thumb, and the tip of the right ear. And that signifies or symbolizes that this little baby girl is going to hear the voice of the Lord. She's going to do the works of the Lord. And she's going to walk in the way of the Lord all the days of her life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. We we faithful in increase. We pray for increase, increase, increase. May the Lord bless you indeed and large your territory. Just stretch your hands toward little Jazaniya, Kylie, Devana, and we are going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this little life. We know that it was ordained by God. She is ordained by God. Her life was ordained by God from the foundations of the earth. You meant for her to be born and to live in such a time as this. And Father God, right now, we cover her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet with the blood of Jesus. We declare, Lord God, that this is a life for you, that she will walk in the ways of the Lord all the days of her life. She will not 
stray to any other paths because you said, Lord God, train up a child in the way they should go and from that way they will not depart from it. Father, we lay hands on her, Father God, and we declare that every organ in her body, every muscle, every tendon, every functioning system in her body functions in the way it was created to function develops in the way it was ordained to develop nothing missing nothing lacking and nothing broken we declare the shalom of God we cancel every assignment of the enemy we declare Lord God that your angels are around her your angels surround her with your peace your angels are protecting her Lord God everywhere that she and her family go in the name of Jesus we declare Psalms 91 over her and we say with long life you shall satisfy her Lord God father I pray that from a very early age her knee shall bow and her tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord that her parents will bring her into the house of the Lord she can hear your word her little heart can be touched and she will accept you as her Savior and her Lord from a very early age. Father God, we pray for the family, the mom, the dad, the aunties, the cousins, the uncles, the godparents. Father God, give them wisdom. Give them prosperity, Lord God. Give them all the resources they need to raise this baby that she could walk in the way that you have mapped out for her. All her days have already been written in your book. And we thank you that she sticks to the path that you have mapped out for her. Today, her parents have brought her into the house of the Lord. And so, as children are a gift from the Lord, Father God, we offer her back to you and say she is your child. Watch over her, bless her, empower her to prosper and succeed until she's fully satisfied in your power, in your presence, and in your provision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I hope you take lots of pictures because she's sitting up so pretty. God bless you. Back to mommy. And we do thank you. We thank you for choosing Rivers of Living Water Christian Center a place to bring her and we hope that you feel comfortable and welcome here and that you will be coming and bringing her on a regular basis god bless you thank you hallelujah another soldier for the kingdom of god some come when they're older some come when they're younger amen amen and the earlier we get them the better it is, because <laughs> that means it's a, just a longer life of serving God. Oh, how many of us wish that we had turned our lives over to God from a very early age? Amen. We would have had so much more time. But don't worry. No regrets. God redeems the time. Hallelujah. All the years that the canker worm and the pal palmer worm stole from you, God says, I will restore them. Everything that God, the devil stole from you, God says, I will restore them. So you're going to get an opportunity. You're getting an opportunity to make up for lost time. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. The days are progressive rapidly. I know every generation says that they live in the last days, but I believe we are definitely living in the last days. These are perilous days, but bless God, we're on the winning side. Tell your neighbor, I'm on the winning side. You're on the winning side. I've read the end of the story, and we win. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful to know? We can skip ahead to Revelations, <laughs> and we have the end of the story there. We've got a little cheat sheet there. God has already showed us how to how to live, how to live. He's, cho he's, he's told us what way to walk in. He says, this is a way. Walk in it. Isn't that wonderful? He's, 
He doesn't leave anything to chance. Everything in your life was not because of chance or coincidence. You are where you are today because it is in God's plan. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. God has a way to turn it around for your good in the end. Amen? Hallelujah. Oh, I give God praise. I give God praise. Last night, I was revisiting the message from last Sunday morning. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you may have gotten a little bit confused because it was listed as being the message for February 3. We seem to be having trouble these days to be able to tell what date it is. So if you're going to label the message for today, it is March 3rd. <laughs> today is March 3rd. Everybody say March 3rd. <laughs> but I was listening to it last night. And oh my goodness, that word was so powerful. Live right. Do right. Act right. Tell the truth. Just so simple. It's so simple to live a righteous life. It's so simple to walk right with God. It is so simple to live a life that is a righteous life. And I remember for years, I struggled with it. I remember when I was a very young baby Christian, and I used to read Romans 8, verse 1. I used to be a bad girl. You say, you, Pastor Tina, a bad girl? I don't believe it. I was a very bad girl. Not bad how you would think, but everybody's bad is, 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 uh, is subjective, right? <laughs> so my bad may not be your bad. Your bad may not be my bad. But guess what? We can do bad all on our own. And the wonderful answer for that is that God has an answer for your bad, and he has an answer for my bad, and he doesn't judge and say your bad is worse than my bad, or my bad is worse than your bad. It's all bad. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Lord. But the gift of God is eternal life. I remember joy when joy, joy and Joshua were little. I was trying to teach them Romans 6. I was trying to really get it in their, their minds. Um, I know I turned, I, I told you go to Romans 8, but I was trying to teach them Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And sometimes the only time that I would have with them, the quiet time that I would have sometimes with them is when I was putting them to bed. So I would read the Bible with them, and I would try to emphasize certain um, topics with them or certain scriptures. And apparently, this one really stuck because Joy told me just a, a, a couple years ago, she's 19 now, and that was way back when they were like six, seven, eight, you know, young little whippersnappers. They're still whippersnappers. But uh, much when they were much younger, and she said, Mommy, you used to scare me with that scripture, especially just before I was going to sleep. You would tell me the wages of sin is death. I said, Joy, I didn't mean to frighten you. I was just trying to get into your, eye, into your little mind that you would know that sin is no good and it's going to lead you down a no good path. But that's the part she remembered, for the wages of sin is death. I did teach the gift of God is eternal life, but she didn't remember that part. And isn't that the truth? We always remember the negative. We don't remember the positive. But God always gives the negative with the positive. Amen? He says, where, where sin abounds, much grace much more abounds. <laughs> So I remember when I was a young Christian, I used to read Romans 8, 
verse 1. And I used to have a real struggle with living right. I come from a Catholic background. Anybody else here come from a Catholic background? I tell you, it's not easy being a Catholic, especially if you want to be a good Catholic. I was trying to be a good little Catholic girl, going to Catholic school, but it just wasn't working. I would do something wrong during the week, and my mom would send me to confession on Saturday night, and I'd have to go into the little box, and the priest was on the other side, and there was a little window in between us, and you slide the little window. Well, I, you don't slide. The priest slides it. And you say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Like the priest was the father. And then he would say, my child, what is your sin? And then you have to confess. You have to say your sins. And then he would give you what is called penance. Either you would have to pray the rosary. And I was really good at praying the rosary. Every little bead is a Hail Mary or an Our Father. And I would make sure, I pr if that was my penance, I would, I, would, I, would, um, I would do my penance so that God could forgive me, so that I could get back in the good graces of God. Because in my heart, I love God and I wanted to please him. And I know that is the heart of many of us today. We love God. We want to please him. We want to do what's right, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. <laughs> we just don't make it sometimes. And so when I got saved and I first heard this scripture, there is therefore now, Romans 8, 1, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I would read that and I was like, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but I feel so condemned. I would sin and I, could, I, I would feel the wrath of God. No matter what God was doing, I would imagine that I was feeling the wrath of God. I would imagine that God looked at me as the worst sinner on earth. I would imagine that if I sinned, God wouldn't answer my prayers. God wouldn't want to do anything for me. God wouldn't bless me. And so I struggled with this, this scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation. If there is therefore now no condemnation, why am I still feeling condemnation? And we have to understand that there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Con condemnation comes from the devil conviction comes from the Holy Spirit conviction is there when we sin to let us know that we have done something wrong conviction is there on the inside and the end result of conviction is to lead us to repentance and reconciliation in our relationship with God condemnation will drive us further away from God. Condemnation brings shame. Condemnation carries with it guilt, where we feel so guilty and so ashamed that we don't, we don't want to go to church. We don't want to read our Bible. We don't want to pray because we just don't feel good enough. We feel so dirty. We feel so ashamed. But the word of God says there is therefore now no condemnation. You have to read the second part of that verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit has set me free from any obligation to sin. The Holy Spirit has accomplished my victory over sin. And that's what I want to share with you today. Living in victory over sin. If, if, if. 
Jesus, the fact is, and you can go to John 19.30 if you don't believe me. The fact is that Jesus accomplished our victory over sin. We had communion last, last Sunday morning. And I know when we have communion that we always emphasize that this is the meal that heals. But communion is not just about the healing aspect. Communion is about celebrating Jesus' victory over sin's bondage in our life. The same blood, the same body that was broken for our sicknesses and diseases was broken and the blood was shed to cover, to erase, to obliterate our record of sin before heaven and all earth. Amen? Hallelujah. So John 19.30 says, when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out. What did he cry out? Tetelestai. It is finished. The struggle against sin is finished. The bondage to sin has been broken. Man's contract with the devil has been broken. The blood of Jesus eradicates every mark against you. So why do we still struggle with sin? And I want to give you, I want to share with you some, some ways that you can walk in victory over sin. First of all, we must walk in the victory and enforce the victory that Jesus has already won for us. When we fall short, which is what sin is, falling short, when we fall short of what is expected, what happens is a sense of defeat begins to overwhelm us. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever experienced, I don't know if, the, if I am the only one that has ever experienced this, but I don't, I don't believe that I'm the only one. And when we begin to struggle in our own strength, we just, it just pulls us further and further down. I think I've told this story before, but um, we, we used to go on a lot of mission trips. And there was one year we went on a mission trip to Belize. So it was, it was um, Apostle, Pastor Penny, Prophet Raymond, myself. Avenel, is Avenel here this morning? So Maureen, a lot, a lot of us ladies, and I, I love to swim. Not that I love to swim, but I love to be in the water. I cannot go to the beach and stay out of the water. Some part of me has to be in the water. So this was one of the days where we were going on a tour, or they would took us down in there, in, in Belize, the rivers run very fast, very fast. They may not be so, so deep, but they run very fast. And, oh gosh, I'm more of a lady in my later years, but back in those days when I was much younger, <laughs> I wasn't much of a lady. I was wearing a skirt though. That should count for something. I was wearing a, a, a jean skirt, and it was a long jean skirt, and it was uh, like almost down to my ankles because it was so comfortable. It's cool, but um, if you had to go to a church where you had to wear skirts, I would pass because I was wearing a skirt. So I think it was Pastor Penny or Prophet Raymond. They went in, into the water, and there was a rope. Now, the rope was to serve the purpose of when boats would cross from one side to the river to the other side of the river, they had to somehow remain connected to that rope <coughs> so that the current would not wash the boat down. Well, when I got in the water with that long jean skirt on, you can just imagine what started to happen. 
the water saturated my skirt. The skirt became heavy. The current was already strong, so mat no matter how strong I was swimming against that current, that river was just carrying me down. You see, we begin to struggle in our own strength. And I was struggling in my own strength. And I wasn't getting anywhere. The current was so powerful. I think um, Prophet Raymond, he, he's, only, he's not much taller than me. He tried to get under me and push me toward the shore. It didn't work. I was still. I said, today, God, I am not going to drown. Actually, that morning in my devotions, the Lord gave me Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah 40, verse 11, where it talks about, though you walk through the, the waters, you sh you'll not be drowned. So the Lord had already given me a word. So there was really, at that point in time, no fear in my heart yet. So... Pastor Penny got under me, and he managed to push me out. But there was no way in my own strength. I've almost drowned twice in my life. you think I would have learned by now <laughs> to stay away from the water. And well, the first time when I drive, dr almost drowned, we were living in St. Lucia. I was about eight years old. I told you I was bad. My parents sent me to the beach with, my mother sent me to the beach with a friend. The friend said, they're leaving. I told the friend, well, my mother said, she's coming for me. I can stay. So I stayed at the beach, and I was in the water around the time when the tides were coming in much stronger. And I think I was, no, I wasn't on an inner tube. And uh, I was getting swept further and further out away from the shore. And a teenage boy happened to see me and pulled me in. So that was the first time I almost drowned. The second time was, uh, was in Belize. So I was struggling in my, I told you all that to tell you this. When we struggle in our own strength, it will never work. We've got to walk in the victory, enforce the victory and realize our position in Christ. Realize who we are, that we have already been given the victory. We've got to realize our position in Christ and then make the decision to stay there. Stay there where God has placed you. Turn with me to Romans 8, verse 29 and 30, and we're going to look at it in the Amplified Version. I wonder if the sound booth could, could assist me with that. Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew and loved and chose chose beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately share in his complete sanctification so that he would be the firstborn, the most beloved, and honored among many believers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified, declared free, of the guilt of sin and those whom he justified, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity. The word of God says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. We are in Christ. That's where we are. Do not let anything try and remove you from being in him, in Christ. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God says, and he's speaking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and he says, let us make man in our image. So when man was created, man was sin-free. 
Man was perfect. Man was clean. Man was not in any bondage to sin. And God's purpose from the beginning is that we be in his image. And that is what Satan attacks the most when he attacks a child of God. We see it when Satan tries to, when Satan comes to Jesus during his 40-day fast in the wilderness. Satan attacks the image of God in Jesus. How does he approach Jesus? What does he say to Jesus? He says more than once, if you are the son of God. Thank you. If you are the son of God. He was attacking Jesus' very identity as a child of God. And when Satan attacks us, that is what he goes for. Your identity as a son or a daughter of God. Your identity as a sanctified, saved, born again, blood washed child of God. He attacks your identity as being in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He doesn't want you to know who you really are. You watch a lot of African movies? ZIZ wants us to watch a lot of African movies. There's one on every day. And the thing is, what burns me sometimes is they only show part of it. Just when you begin to get into it, it quits. But I'm sure there's an African movie somewhere out there. I was, there was one on. It was a, a young girl, and she lived with her stepmother and her father and her step stepsisters. And the stepmother misused and abused her every day because of something that the stepmother had against that child's mother in the past. And this is what Satan will do. He will try and get everything to misuse and abuse you so you do not know whose child you are. You have to know whose child you are, whose image you are made in. You have to know what are your rights and your benefits and your privileges as a child of God. And say, devil, you can't bully me anymore. You can't intimidate me anymore. You cannot separate or get in between God and I. And I will not allow sin to come between me and God. I sin, but the blood of Jesus is able. The sacrifice of Jesus is able. He is able. He pulled me from the miry pit. He pulled my feet out of the miry clay. That miry clay of sin, don't let it pull you down any further. You don't have to be in the mud and the muck. And the miry clay swimming around with the devil. You can live a higher life. Live the life that Jesus paid for. Live the life that God ordained for you. Hallelujah. (laughs) Last night, it was so funny. The, the, The village where I lived, my neighbor just directly in front of me was having a party. And so, all like 7, 8 o'clock at night, the music started. And if you had called me on the phone last night, you would have thought that I was right in the party. But no, I was not. I was in my house with my doors locked, tried to shut the windows, but still wasn't working. Tried to go to bed. Still heard the music. And the music, I'm sure it lasted, Joshua told me it lasted until about 3 this morning. But I love sleep, so I I usually don't. If I'm tired enough, I will just sleep regardless. (laughs) So I went to sleep, woke up, music was still on. Went to sleep, woke up again, music was still on. 
went to sleep, woke up again, still hearing loud voices about 4.15 in the morning. So anyway, you know, you don't have to be in sin to be tempted to sin. So I'm standing in my house, and the music is coming on, and pretty soon, you start to... Then all of a sudden, broke it, set it, broke it. <laughs> and I was walking in the house. Some sweet music. And Joshua was sitting at the table, eating, and I was coming like this. And Joshua said, Mommy, I said, I can't help it. And Joshua said, Mommy, you can help it. Yes, and that's the truth. We can help it. God has given us charge over this body and its desires. He's given us, he's put us in charge. And God doesn't change. He still wants man in his image. And after sin, the image of God in man became marred. Sin marred the image, but there are still aspects and attributes of man that are godlike. So, if we go to 2 Corinthians 3.18, 2 Corinthians 3.18 in the Amplified Version, we could look at it in the Amplified Version, it's, we can see that Christ-likeness, becoming Christ-like, is a gradual process. Why do you think our vision, when we say it, we say we are being raised up to be a mighty people with God. We are being raised up. That speaks of a process. You may not be there yet. You may not be there tomorrow, but you are in the process of becoming a mighty person in God. Tell your neighbor, I'm in the process. And sometimes that it's not an easy process. There's going to be setbacks. There's going to be pitfalls. But like Joshua told me, Mommy, you can help it. You can help it. We're in the process, so stay in the process. Don't come out of the process. Allow God to work on you. Allow the Holy Spirit to take over and do it for you. We're going to talk more about that. So 2 Corinthians 3.18, Christ-likeness is a gradual process. And we all, with unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one that is forming us and molding us and chiseling us. And if you go into the Greek word picture of that scripture, the Holy Spirit is the sculpture. The sculptor has some tools that he uses. He uses a hammer. The Holy Spirit has a hammer. Do you know what it's called? The Word. The Word. God's Word is like a hammer. And that hammer is not to bash you on the head and crush you to pieces. No. That hammer is to put a little boop boop here, a little boop boop there, a little bend there, maybe push some things into place here, boop 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 boop. The hammer is to mold and shape you. And then the, 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 the sculptor has another tool. It's, it's a chisel. And 
he uses that hammer and that chisel together. And he takes the hammer and he, 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 he bangs on the chisel and the chisel shapes and molds and forms all the, the different features and characteristics. So allow the word, allow the Holy Spirit to use the word of God to mold and to form you until you are in God's perfect image. We are being changed into the image of Jesus. And the glory of the Lord is what needs to be, what should be reflecting out of us. How much time do you spend in front of the mirror? Some of us spend more time than others. I don't spend a lot of time, and I'm sure you can tell that by my appearance. But the mirror in this is the word of God. How much time do you spend in the word of God? So that the more, the, 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 the greater the degree of glory that God's word has got to take over in our lives, not just reading it or saying it, but doing it. That's how God is forming us and shaking us and making us more Christ-like. Amen? Number two, you've got to realize that you can't walk out the victory on your own. I had to realize my skirt was too heavy. I was not winning the battle against that river. I needed help. And help was there. All I had to do was accept it. And we, have, we can't walk out the victory on our own. The victory over sin has already been accomplished by Jesus. He's already done everything he can or ever will do to establish you in victory. So don't be praying and say, Lord, save me, because he's already saved you. Don't be praying, Lord, help me, because he's already helped you. He's already given you everything you need to live godly in this life. To walk the path of godliness. He's rescued us from an eternity of separation from God. I remember there's one thing from the past. There's two things from that movie, The Passion of the Christ, that I will, I will never, those two images will never leave my mind. The first image is Jesus getting the stripes on his back. That I will never forget that. And I will never allow those stripes to go to waste. He, every stripe was for my healing. I will never allow sickness or disease to reign in my body because Jesus already paid the price and took those terrible, nasty stripes, his back being ripped open. So by his stripes, we're healed. And the second image from that movie that I will never forget is at the end when... Jesus has risen, and he's coming up out of the grave, and the stone is removed, and then all of a Satan, they show all of a, all of a, all of a sudden they show Satan, and he's he's finally got it, that his crucifying the Son of God was only playing into God's plan, and you see him in a dry and parched wilderness with broken stones and rocks all around. And he's screaming like, ah, I made a big mistake. But to me, that signified that Jesus has saved me, rescued me from an eternity of separation from God. And that is what has to give us such an urgency in this world today, your neighbor, your family member, your co-worker, that eternal separation from God could be their portion. They need us to talk to them. They need us to reach out to them. They need us to bring the gospel to them and, and help to rescue them from an eternal separation with God. Jesus has rescued us from eternal separation from God. And if you're here today and you're not saved, 
that eternal separation from God could very well be your portion if you don't make a decision soon. I don't know why we keep putting off the decision. We think we have a lot of time. We think our life is going good. We don't need Jesus. We don't need church. We don't need, you know, we don't need somebody. The devil is a liar. The sooner you make the decision to give your life to God, the sooner your eternal future is secured in Christ. In Christ. And so we've got to, we are living, that's what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But now we're talking about living and walking and being and doing right day to day, down in the trenches, real life moment to moment, situation to situation. That's where it gets rough. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the enemy seeks to get you. But I always look at 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10 in the Amplified Version. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10 tells us that there is someone who is there. But he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, always available, regardless of the situation. He says, my grace, my strength, my power, my ability is more than enough for you when you're at school and that boy there or that girl there wants you to smoke some weed. My grace, my loving kindness, my mercy is more than enough. It's always available, regardless of the situation. When you're with your girlfriend and your boyfriend and things are getting hot and they want you to spend the night. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more bo gladly boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. His grace is sufficient. He's given us his grace not so that when we sin, we can ask for forgiveness. He's given us his grace to keep us from sin. His grace is sufficient. To keep us walking right. His grace is sufficient to enable us to live right and make the right choice and speak the truth and walk the truth and talk the truth. Hallelujah. So I'm well pleased with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, and with difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak in human strength, when I want to give up, give in to sin, when every fleshly desire in my body is crying out to be satisfied, when I'm weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly drawing from God's strength. It's God's strength. It's Christ in us. It's his grace, his power, his Holy Spirit that enables us to live right. God's strength and power are fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effective in your weakness. Because the weaker you are, the more you have to depend on him. With less of you, there is more of God. With more of you, there's less of God. When we are weak in human strength, then we are strong in divine strength. 
And the picture that we get from the Greek there is that his strength enfolds and covers us, our weakness like a tent. The tent that covers and shields and protects us. His grace will come. He says there's no temptation that we can encounter that Jesus hasn't already encountered as a man, not as a God, as a man. The Bible says that he was tempted yet without sin. We can be tempted and just like Jesus, be yet without sin. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your greatest weakness can actually become your greatest weapon if you allow it to drive you closer to God. Your handicap, handicap can become your advantage. Your handicap can become your advantage. Think of a blind person, somebody who lo loses their sight. Once one sense is lost, the other senses get stronger. So if you lose your sight and you've lost that sense, you've lost the ability to see, you still have touch, you still have taste, you still have smell, you still have hearing. And all those other senses magnify and get stronger because of the absence of the ability to see. So your handicap can become your advantage. God's power will not be seen if you keep trying to do it on your own. Because God uses people, he uses vessels that make him look good. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 to 29. And I think I want to read this from the Passion Translation. Ever since Apostle um, showed that 1 Corinthians chapter 1, ever since he introduced us to that translation, I have just been basking in it. It says, but God chose whom the world considers foolish to shame those who think they are wise. And God chose the puny and powerless to shame the high and mighty. Verse 28, so that there he chose the lowly, the laughable, in the world's eyes, nobodies, so that he could shame the somebodies, for he chose what is regarded as insignificant in order to supersede what is regarded as prominent. Verse 29. So that there would be no place for prideful boasting in God's presence. God chooses vessels, he chooses people that are going to show him off, that are going to make him look good. What glory would God get out of your life if you could do it on your own? What glory would God get out of someone who can do it all on their own? Can you get any gratification out of anyone who doesn't need your help? Have you ever been around somebody like that? No matter what you do, give or say, they don't need your help. You like spe do, do you want to be around that kind of person? No, because it makes you feel that they don't need you. And this is sometimes how we can make God feels like, feel like we, does, we don't need him. We need him. We need his strength to cover our weakness. Because it's when we are at his weakness that his, when we are at our weakest, that his strength kicks in. His power, his ability, his grace is sufficient. Don't let your flesh get in the way of God's glory. 
Hallelujah. Realize that victory over sin does not exist apart from being in Christ. Go to John 15, verse 4. And I think I'm going to read it in the Amplified. John 15, verse 4. It says, John, remain in me and I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself without remaining in the vine, neither can you bear fruit, produce evidence of your faith, unless you remain in me. The Prussian translation puts it like this. So you must remain, let me go up to, to verse 1. Jesus says, I am a true sprouting vine, and the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches, pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I've spoken over you have already cleansed you. So you must remain in life union with me, for I remain in life union with you. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. Our victory over sin does not exist apart from being in Christ. To abide means to remain, to rest, to settle down, to make him your dwelling. Find yourself in Christ. Abiding includes two vital aspects. What you are in, in Christ, and who is in you, the Holy Spirit. Jesus later down says, I've sent my spirit. I've sent my Holy Spirit that he can be your helper. Why do you think he's called the Holy Spirit? Holy is not just his first name. Holy is his function. He makes you holy. He makes it able for you. He enables you to live holy, to walk holy. Hallelujah. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29. Romans 8, verse 29, we want to read that. There's a very important word in that verse. For though, Romans 8, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew and loved and chose beforehand, he also predestined to what? Be conformed, to be conformed to the image. And the word conformed means that you're connected to an object of resemblance. How many of you remember the old Terminators movies? Terminator 1 and Terminator 2. I think it's Terminator 2 where we get, we have the original Terminator that's been sent back to the past and then in terminator 2 we have the bad terminator that's been sent back to the past to try and wipe out the original terminator now this second terminator the bad terminator had a special skill whatever he connected himself to he would turn into that thing and that's that was part of his powers so whatever he connected to, he conformed into it to fool people and to deceive people. So, like I said, you have to be connected to an object of resemblance. You have to be attached to Jesus to become like Jesus. It won't happen from just reading the word alone. It won't happen 
from just coming to church. It will happen because your mom is a Christian or your dad is a Christian and they bring you to church. It won't happen that way. It won't happen because Pastor Penny is your godfather. <laughs> it will only happen once you are connected to Jesus. Once you are in Christ and you have a relationship with him and you're living to please him and you're living to serve him. In John 15, 2, we read that Jesus gives life to the branches. We are the branches and he is the vine. And just like any good tree, the life flows from the branches to the vine. And the vine is supposed to pr produce fruit. If we go outside and we see a mango tree, good branches, good vine, good, good leaves, but no fruit, we're very disappointed. And what do we actually do? We chop down those branches off. We cut them back. Because like Apostle said, last week he was talking about the yellow jacket or the yellow, the yellow thing that sucks the life out of anything it attaches to. Those branches are just going to be there. Those vines are just going to be there, sucking the life out, but not producing any fruit. Not producing anything. And there's a lot of people in church like that. Pastor Tina, yes, there's a lot of people in church. They're there. They want to be vines, but they're not producing any fruit. Their life is not producing any fruit. And if you look at them when they're not in church, you would never recognize that they're a vine connected to the tree. Because there's no fruit. There's no evidence. There's no proof that they're connected to Jesus. But if you're connected to Jesus, there's going to be fruit in your life. If you stay connected to the vine, fruit is going to show up. It's just obvious. It's just got to happen. You can't stop the fruit from growing. That's what the fruit of the Spirit are. They have to come once you're connected to Jesus. Once the Holy Spirit is there, there's going to be love. There's going to be joy. There's going to be peace. There's going to be patience. There's going to be self-control. You can't stop the fruit once you're connected to the vine. Once you're connected to the branches. His life must flow through us. John 10.10 10 says, Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that more abundant. And the Greek word for life there is the Zoe life of God. The God kind of life. Or life as God has it. And the more of God's life that fills our being the greater the resistance to sin. I'm going to say that again. The more of God's life that fills our being, the greater the resistance to sin. Sometimes we try so hard resisting to sin and forget about connecting to the vine. But if we put our effort into connecting to the vine, resistance to sin would just be a natural outcome of it. If we concentrate on him and living in the overflow with him, it's all about Jesus. John 5, 39 says, you search the scriptures looking for me, but I'm right here. I've been here. And if we concentrate on connecting to him, we're not going to have to worry about resistance to sin. It's just going to become an automatic, we're just going to form that automatic immunity to sin. It's just going to be automatic. It's just going to be uh, God's life in you. It quells the attraction to sin. Remember I told you I was bad? I used to have a real problem with stealing. You don't have to worry now. I'm saved and delivered several years now. 
I used to have a real problem with stealing. By the time I was 12, 13, 14, I was shoplifting clothing and jewelry from stores, from malls. When I was about seven or eight, I was shoplifting candy bars from grocery stores, candy from grocery stores. And I got saved. And this one thing I struggled with. But one day I realized that my desire to please God, as I got more of God in me, and as I got closer to him, and as I got filled with the Holy Spirit, just like Apostle was saying last week, once he got filled with the Holy Spirit, those things that affected and tempted the other boys of his generation didn't affect and tempt him. Once I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I realized I love God more than I love stealing. I love God more than I love lying. I wanted to please God more than I wanted those things that I stole. And this is, this is how we live in victory to sin. When, when we realize that the more of God's life that fills our being, the greater the resistance to sin. God's life in you repels the attraction to sin. Go to Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. Hallelujah. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, please. Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. The Word of God tells us to walk. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in union with him, reflecting his character in the things you do and say, living lives that... What does it say? Lead others away from sin. And verse 7. Having been deeply rooted in him and now being continually built up in him and becoming increasingly more established in your faith just as you were taught and of overflowing in it with gratitude. Once we get closer to Christ, the overflow will be conformity. Once we get more in and walk and regulate our lives and conduct ourselves in union with and in conformity to him, once our roots grow down stronger in him, go back to verse 6, we begin to reflect his character more and more in the things that we do and say. We begin to live lives that lead others away from sin. So you've got to have your roots down deep in him. Galatians 5.25. Can we go there quickly? It talks about conduct again. Galatians 5 verse 25. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit does part and we do part. The Holy Spirit can't do his part and we not do our part because we are being raised up to be a mighty people with God, not apart from God, not God doing it on his own or us doing it on our own, but with God. We're partners in this life together. If we claim to live by the Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, and moral courage, our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then let's go to 1 John 2, verse 6. 1 John 2, verse 6. 1 John 2, verse 6 in the Amplified. Whoever says he lives in Christ, that is, whoever says he has accepted him as God and Savior, ought, has a moral obligation to walk and conduct himself just as he, Jesus, walked and conducted himself. A moral obligation. That means 
us. We have to do it. That's our part in it. And finally, Galatians 2 verse 20. Galatians 2 verse 20 is the key to all of this. And we're going to look at it in the Amplified Version. Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. That is, in him, I have shared his crucifixion. It's no longer I who live. It's no longer Tina who lives. But Christ lives in Tina. The life that Tina now lives in the body, Tina lives by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved her and gave himself up for him. The old Tina was crucified with Christ. The old Tina that loved to sin and do bad was nailed to the cross when Jesus was nailed to the cross. If you don't believe me, go to Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. If you are a Christian, when you read the book of Romans, I would, I would advise you to read the book of Romans, especially chapters 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Read them. In not just one translation, read them in the Amplified, read them in the New Living Testament, read them in the Passion Translation. Read it until you get it. Because these, these, these um, things that Paul is talking about in Romans 6 are mind-blowing and life-changing. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, 7, and 8, we have it in the... We have, therefore, we know that our old self, our human nature, without the Holy Spirit, was nailed to the cross with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Tell your neighbor, I am not a slave to sin. I am not a slave to sin. Verse 7 for the person who has died with Christ has been freed from the power of sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live together with him. Because we know the self-evident truth that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. Could it be any clearer that our former identity of sinner is now and forever deprived of its power? For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. Tell sin, I'm not your monkey anymore. I am not your monkey anymore. You know, you walk out on Port Zante and you see these guys with, with monkeys on, and they have the leash around their neck and they've got the little diaper on their bum. And the tourists like to take pictures. Not me. I don't want to take a picture with a monkey that's in bondage. Leave the monkey where it is. Listen, I am not your monkey anymore. I don't belong to you. You can train me and reign over me like I'm some trained animal. I'm not your monkey anymore. Could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? For we were cru co-crucified with him to dismantle. When those nails were going into Jesus' hands as he was being crucified on the cross, that stronghold of sin was being dismantled on the inside of you. It was being destroyed so that when you stepped into your new life with Christ, you really did become a new creation in him. 
obviously, a dead person is incapable of sinning. We have funerals here all the time. Although it's a sad occasion, if we went up to that body in that coffin and tried to get its attention, tried to get it to sit up, tried to, to hit it, it wouldn't feel a thing. How many of you saw that, my, week, that movie years ago, Weekend with Bernie? Weekend at Bernie's. For those of you that are millennials, it was, it's a movie about two teenagers taking a, a, a dead body, pretending that that person is alive for a weekend. You could take a dead person, a dead man, into a brothel, and that man would not be tempted. Obviously, a dead person is incapable of sinning. And if we were co-crucified with the anointed one, we know that we will also share in the fullness of his life. The Bible says we are dead to sin. That means sin has no effect on us. We're incapable of sinning. This is what the word of God says. And this is what will bring this into a reality in your life. And we know that since the anointed one, the yoke destroying, burden removing one, has been raised from the dead to die no more, his resurrection life has vanquished death and its power over him is finished. For by his sacrifice, he died to sin's power once and for all. And that doesn't mean once and for all time. That means once and for all people. For Tina, for Joy, for Joshua, for Keisha, for Tony, for Paulette, for Marjorie. Once and for all. But he now lives continuously for the Father's pleasure. So let it be the same way with you. Since you are now joined with him, you must continually view yourselves as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the anointed one. I've got to read that again. That is so good. So let it be the same way with you. Since you are now joined with him, you must continually view yourselves as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the anointed one. We could close it down right there, lock up the church and go home with that word. We had a 21-day fast during the month of January. And I was talking with a couple people who experienced the same thing that I experienced. When we've had 21-day fast in the, in, I will confess, when we've had 21-day fast before, I used to say, well, I'm not sure how much I could commit. I'm not sure how much I could commit to that 21-day fast. I don't know if I can eat, abstain from eating. I'm not like some of you that can go without food or water for days on end. But there was a special grace. I sensed a special grace this year upon this fast that we did. And because of that grace, I was enabled and empowered to fast like I have never fasted before. And that fasting opened my eyes to see food in a way that I've never seen food before. <laughs> to, the, to the result that there's certain foods now I just will not eat because I feel that 
as I'm eating that food, I'm putting poison in my body, and it really was poisoning my body. Certain foods and the certain ways I was eating, and I can say that for a fact, because having not eaten them for about two months now, my body feels totally different. Inflammation is down. Things, my skin, I had a skin condition for who knows how a year battling some kind of skin condition, went to the dermatologist. The dermatologist just looked at me over her, peered at it, and then prescribed some expensive cream, which did no good because they're going to, they're going to anything you have wrong with your skin, they're just going to lump it into eczema. And I know I don't have eczema. I don't have eczema, I don't have asthma, I don't have diabetes, I don't have high blood pressure because by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. And so there was a special grace that was upon me. And now when I see those foods, like I am a meat eater. I love meat, I love bacon, I love ham, I love turkey, I love chicken, I love ground beef. I love stew beef. I love curry chicken. <laughs> oh, any other meats out there? I love mutton. Pork, okay. From time to time. I love hot dogs. I love hamburgers. I love pizza. I am a long time meat eater. But God, I'm to the point now where just like we have to be dead to sin in our body, I'm dead to those foods. Those foods have lost their attraction for me because of the fruits and the results that I'm seeing, having not experiencing them and taking part in them. And that's the point where we have to get in our lives with God where we see the fruit and the results that we're experiencing by being connected and close and intimate. We see the fruit of being victorious over sin, so sin does, has no attraction for us. But the attraction now has become the word of God and God's presence and God's house and God's people. And and when we get to that point in our lives, acting right, doing right, being right will just be so easy. There'll just be a grace. Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to close there. Hallelujah. We give God praise. Hallelujah. I know we made, we made fun of it, but there are people, there could be people here in this place this morning that you're going through a struggle with sin. Like, we made light of it, but it's, it is a big thing. And I wonder if we could all stand this morning. First of all, I'm going to make an appeal for those of you that you are not entirely sure that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven and God would let you in. You're not entirely sure that that would be the case. If you're here this morning and you feel like you're on a fast track to hell, you don't even have to feel like you're on a fast track to hell. You could feel out of sorts. You could feel defeated by life. I want to pray with you this morning and give you an opportunity to come into that Zoe life, to experience that Zoe life that God wants to give you today. If you're here today and you want to make that decision, can you just lift your hand so that we can pray for you? If you're here today and you have not ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You have not yet experienced that freedom from, from sin and uh, freedom from attraction to sin. Just lift your hand and we want to pray for you.
the second um, opportunity for prayer that we want to have this morning is for those of you that are where I was, where you just feel defeated by sin, you feel like you're in a losing battle for sin, you hear all this preaching about righteousness and holiness and, and, and living for God, but you do not feel yet that you are able to do that. We want to pray for you this morning. I want to invite you up to the, to the, the altar so that we can surround you and, and pray for you this morning. If you're, if you're experience that, experiencing that struggle with sin,
via YouTube or on the internet in any way, I just want you to lift your hands and, and join with me in this prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for those who are here and those who are listening, Lord God, all around the world. Father God, I renounce every lie of the enemy to their minds. I declare, Father God, where the enemy has told them that they are losers, that they are defeated, that they are condemned, that they are full of guilt and shame. Father God, I speak and declare your word that they are victorious in Christ. They are accepted in the beloved. They are washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. They are no longer slaves to sin, but they are new creatures in Christ Jesus. And they are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Father God, I thank you, Lord God, that this revelation and this truth, Lord God, would reverberate, Lord God, to the very depths of this spirit, Lord God, that it would become reality and actuality in their mind and in their soul, Father God. We reject every lie of the enemy. We reject every sense of defeat. We reject every spirit of condemnation. We reject every spirit of guilt. We reject every spirit of shame. Lord God, Jesus, even as you wrote in the on the floor on the ground, and you said to the woman, caught in the act of adultery. Where are your accusers? Father God, I thank you that we will no longer hear the voice of our accuser. The accuser of the brethren, Satan himself. 
Father God, if there's anyone in this room or under the sound of my voice who has been listening to the accuser and the voice of the accuser, Lord God, has been keeping them from walking in their victory over sin, from walking in righteousness, we silence that voice today. We deafen their ear to that voice today. And we thank you, Lord God, that their ears will be married to the voice of the Lord that says, I love you. I have bought you with a price. You're mine. You're clean. You're redeemed. You're free. And we declare, Lord God, freedom from every bondage, freedom from every stronghold, whatever it be, alcohol, sex, drug addiction, lying, stealing, whatever it is, Lord God, we stand in our authority, we stand in our victory, and we declare, Lord God, that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When you see us, you see the blood. When you see us, you don't see sin. You see the blood. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Lord God, that even as Jesus spoke to the woman caught in the act of adultery and said, go and sin no more, we are empowered. Your grace is sufficient. Your strength is made perfect in our weakness that we can go and sin no more. In Jesus' name, we declare, Tedalastai, it is finished. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You're dismissed.